Back in 2017, we spoke about D.B. Cooper, a man who jumped out of a plane and into history. Nice. For full details, we're going to give some background, but if you want the full background and the full story, you want to listen to episode 16 of this podcast. We have linked it in the show notes, but let's do that recap. On November 24th, 1971, a man hijacked a Boeing 727 aircraft after boarding under the false name Dan Cooper. The flight was a short one from Portland, Oregon up to Seattle, Washington. Cooper sat in the back of a plane, and after ordering a drink, he handed a flight attendant named Florence Schaffner a note. At first, she didn't read the note, assuming that the man was coming on to her, but he told her that he had a bomb in his suitcase. When he opened the case, she saw what she believed to be just that, several sticks of dynamite wired to a battery. Schaffner took Cooper's demands, wrote them on a note, and took them to the captain. He had requested $200,000, which is about $1.5 million today. It's, it's a lot of money, Mike. Uh, he also demanded two parachutes and that the plane be refueled upon landing. The airline approved the ransom, and the flight landed in Seattle, and Cooper's demands were met, including a bag of 10,000 unmarked $20 bills. Those bills had been photographed by the FBI before handing over. It's like, yeah, we're not going to mark them. Yeah. But we're going to know what they are. <laughs> we know all about them. Uh -huh. We named them all individually. Mm -hmm. Cooper then allowed the passengers to exit the plane, along with all but one of the flight attendants. The crew was directed to fly south toward Mexico City. The remaining flight attendant, a woman named Tina Mucklow, was instructed to lower the rear staircase of the plane, but she refused out of fear and then Cooper sent her to the front of the plane before opening the stairs himself. There have been issues refueling the plane in Seattle, so there was going to be a stop in Reno, Nevada. The crew radioed to the back of the plane to tell Cooper they needed to raise the stairs before landing, but he didn't respond. Once on the ground, it was clear that he had parachuted out of the rear of the plane, probably at about 8.13pm, when the crew noted the tail of the plane pitching upward for a moment. Yeah, that's, uh, that's when he jumped. But we're going to get mm -hmm. into that and what happened after the jump, after this break. This episode of Ungenius is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. So whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, you can stand out with a beautiful website, you can engage with your audience, and you can sell anything, products, services, and even content. Because Squarespace has everything you need all in one place, all on your terms. With Squarespace, you can make the most of design intelligence. Look, a lot of us aren't designers. We kind of know what we want, but maybe we don't know how to get there. Well, design intelligence at Squarespace combines two decades of industry-leading design expertise with cutting-edge AI technology to unlock your strongest creative potential. It empowers anyone to build a beautiful, personalized website tailored to their unique needs and craft a bespoke digital identity to use across one's entire online presence. Maybe you've got a bunch of video on your website and you just don't want to you, know, you don't send some place visitors someplace else you want to build a really nice video library. Squarespace makes that easy. You can organize your content and showcase it on beautiful video pages and you can even sell access to your video library by adding a paywall to your content. And it's really easy to do that too. Squarespace payments make it super easy to get paid all in one place. Onboarding is fast and simple. You just get started with a few clicks and then you're receiving payments. Plus you give your customers more ways to pay by choosing from popular payment methods like Klarna, ACH, Direct Debit, Apple Pay, Afterpay, and Clearpay depending on where you're located. I've been using Squarespace for years. I love building on it. We're currently doing a membership sale here at Relay. We built that site on Squarespace. It looks great. It's easy to do. And it is, uh, it's a true joy to build on this platform. So head on over to squarespace.com to sign up for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash ungeniused, and you're going to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name. That's squarespace.com slash ungeniused for 10% off your first purchase when you decide to sign up. 
Our thanks to Squarespace for their support of the show and all of Relay. As you can imagine, there was a massive search for the hijacker, but no significant evidence was found, and it's possible the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens destroyed any uncovered evidence. Conspiracy. <laughs> was, was, that's what we're talking about today. We've got the Cooper responsible for the eruption conspiracy here. On, no, The FBI closed the case in 2016 despite some of the ransom money turning up in places over the years. They had talked to thousands of suspects in the meantime, but didn't get any good results. And this is where we pick things up today. This is where the update comes in. Richard McCoy Jr. was one of those suspects that Mike mentioned. He was a Vietnam War veteran and a recreational skydiver. He knew what he was doing. In April of 1972, he hijacked a plane out of Denver, Colorado, in a very similar fashion to D.B. Cooper. But he was arrested just two days later. He parachuted out over Utah. And the FBI found him pretty quickly after a tip from the public. And almost all of, the, of his $500,000 ransom was found in his home. He was sentenced to 45 years in prison, but McCoy obviously escaped in 1970. I mean, obviously, right? Look at this guy. Obviously escaped in 1973, uh, but was killed in a shootout with FBI agents three months later. In 1991, parole officer Bernie Rhodes and a former FBI agent named Russell Kalame. Kalame? Kalame. Sure. Wrote a book titled D.B. Cooper, The Real McCoy. Whoa. In which they say McCoy was D.B. Cooper. You'd have to write that book. Yeah. You know, you got a pun like that, you got to do it. You got your, your beholden to humankind. Yeah. The FBI didn't seriously consider McCoy a suspect back in the day because he didn't match the age or description given by witnesses of that original D.B. Cooper hijacking. Uh, and he was reportedly in Las Vegas the day of the crime. McCoy's widow, Karen, sued the authors and publishers of the book, as well as her former attorney, to have the book pulled from the shelves, as she claimed it misrepresented her involvement in the hijacking. It came out in court that she had been deeply involved, but the book was allowed to stay on sale. However, rights for the book to be sold to a film studio were blocked, and Karen was awarded a settlement. That all got settled in 1994, but the story still lives on today. In 2020... It was revealed that McCoy actually had been a suspect as recently as 2006. It was a little, little unclear how interested the FBI was in this guy. Oh, interesting. Huh. So that brings us to today. It's here that we meet Dan Greider, a retired pilot who has investigated the case over the course of the last two decades. Greider has published a series of YouTube videos on the subject over the years. He showed the world a video of a parachute that was found on the McCoy's property. He said it was a, quote, one in a billion find, as the parachute had modifications made to it that matched alterations made to the one supplied by D.B. Cooper 50 years earlier. So how does one modify a parachute? Well, these changes included the moving of the ripcord handle from the left side to the right side, as well as cutting some straps and adding D-ring attachments and enlarging the pack tray to hold a larger chute. Uh, all this was done with hand-done stitching, according to Grider, and all these changes showed up on this parachute that was supposedly found on the McCoy's land. Grider believes that McCoy's trip to Las Vegas was a lie told to Karen to throw off the FBI, but the validity of that claim is unclear. Potentially very sketchy stuff here. McCoy's own children have gone on the record saying they believe their father was D.B. Cooper. And it's reported that the FBI has reopened the case. But of course, the government can neither confirm nor deny. You really seem to like to talk about this guy. Are you trying to throw him off the scent, Stephen? Are you D.B. Cooper? <laughs> I mean, it happened like 15 years before I was born. but Did it? I'll I'll never tell. <laughs> How can we tell? We do say you're old a lot. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's that's you not... actually are like really old. Would you parachute out of a plane? No. It's one of these things that I don't see why I should do that. You know what I mean? Like that that's one of these things where I'm like, no, I'm okay. Same as like bungee jumping. It's like, no, I'm fine. Like I'm not gonna do that. I, I I'll live without that. It's totally fine. 
I'm not afraid of heights, but I'm not going to jump out of an airplane either. I, I've told this story before. I have been in a parachuting jumping situation, uh, but I was filming for a project <laughs> oh, okay. and I stayed in the plane. I did not. Right. I did like, not what go out the what side. is that? Like a like a parachute jumping situation. I don't know. I, <laughs> the, parachuting was happening. I wasn't involved. I was I was safely buckled into a seat in the airplane. But flying in a plane with the door open, very strange. Yep. Mike, we have an announcement to make here at the end of the episode. We do. Uh, so my wife and I are expecting a baby in the new year. Uh, so our, our first child, and because of that. I'm deciding that it's time to make some changes to the amount and frequency of projects that I'm doing. So you're jumping out of an airplane with a bucket full of cash. Correct. (laughs) No, first of all, deepest congratulations and love to you and Adina. But one of those changes does concern this show. Uh, Ungenius is going to be going on hiatus after this episode. Again. Again. That's right. Yeah, this this is a hard decision. This show was the first podcast that the two of us ever worked on. Um, it was about 13 years ago or something, well before we founded Relay together, and then we stopped doing this show, we did others, and then when, you know, over time we've brought it back. Yeah, when we started Relay, we, we told each other that we would bring back the show when we both quit our jobs to work for ourselves, and we were able to do that. Uh, but for now, it's time to put the show aside again. But, uh... You know, season three could could be out there somewhere. And have we retroactively put this show into seasons now? Is that how that yeah, works? Yeah, well, season one, so those those episodes 13 years ago, which are not on the internet because they're terrible, that's season one. Terrible, so bad, you don't want them. Yeah. This has been season two, 224 episodes. Uh, and, you know, season three is out there in the future somewhere. Yeah, I'm I'm confident that the show will come back at some point in some form in the future, but we're not going to make any promises on that for right now. That's right. So for now, thank you for listening and supporting our podcast here for so long. Until next time we pass a flight attendant a note, Mike. Say goodbye. Goodbye.